Okay, so talk today is about thinking more product, moving from Scrum to a dual track, agile approach. So firstly, a little bit about me. I'm a consultant digital program director working in London. Um, I love mountains and travel. If you follow me on Instagram, I spam all my followers with loads of travel pictures. And also I love speaking at conferences like this and really sharing with the community and engaging in conversations. Um, you can follow me on Twitter here and talk to me on Twitter here, talk about me on Twitter if you want. Um, go ahead. So I've worked on quite a few different clients and brands over the past sort of 14 years or so. And today I'm going to be talking to you about one particular brand, which is Specsavers, which you can see on the right-hand side there. But more about that later. So back in 2005, when I started out in this kind of digital world, how did software projects run? So how we looked at it was the classic project management, um, golden triangle, we call it. So scope, cost, and time. How we measure project success is if we come in on time, if we come in on budget, if we hit the deliverables that we defined right up front. What else is it about projects that we sort of measure? So the PMI, the Project Management Institute, says that a project is temporary in that it has a defined beginning and end in time and therefore defined scope and resources. And the key word here is temporary. A project starts and it finishes. So here's your project. There's the start. Your project goes along. And here's that magic point where everything ends. It's all finished. It's all good. Said no one ever. This doesn't actually happen. We're building products and services that continue past the end of a, pro um, a project. So they just continue on. A project stops. So today I want you to forget about projects. I want you to think more product. And also, what about Agile? We're at an Agile conference. Um, how did Agile sort of exist in 2005, again, when I started out? So obviously, the Agile Manifesto came out in 2001. But in 2005, when I started, it was still quite a waterfall sort of process. It was quite gated. We went from um, discover through define, design, development, QA, and then launch at the end. But slowly and surely, Agile started coming into our world, and everyone started being Agile, doing Agile, sort of using varying processes to varying degrees of success, without sometimes really knowing what Agile actually means. And I think this is a really good example of it. So this is um, an Agile map landscape done by Deloitte. And it shows you all the frameworks, terminologies, methodologies. And look how confusing it is. To me, it's a bit like Bangalore traffic. <laughs> Very confusing and busy. So everyone's quite confused about what to use, what sort of framework to use, what methodology to apply to their projects, their products. So today, I want you to also forget Agile. Now, I know that sounds a little bit controversial to say at an Agile conference, but what I want to focus on is that there are some really good basic principles of delivering a product. So firstly, customer first. This is the kind of crucial thing that should underpin any product or service. So it's about prioritizing the customer and the outcomes that they want and need. So it's about focusing on the customer and the outcomes, not the actual outputs, not the features. Like, what, what changes do you want to make? What changes do you want in the customer? What changes do you want in behavior? It's about valuing getting working designs, prototypes, and software over defining requirements up front. So don't just define what you want, what features and deliverables you want, and then sort of design, build, et cetera, release it, and then sort of see how it is. It's getting something working to the customer quickly so that you can feedback and iterate. It's all about this feedback loop and getting the customer feedback into the loop and so you can iterate your product. So frequent delivery is the second principle. It's about delivering a working product quickly to the customer. Again, it's about the customer. But frequently delivering means you're putting something in front of the customer so that you're getting that feedback and you're getting that into um, your product. And it's about the team and your customers working together to make adjustments. So it's not just your team deciding what you want to change, what you want to adapt and iterate on. It's asking your customers what they think. Do they like what you're doing? Does it suit their needs? Does it solve their problems? And then making adjustments. So iterative development, releasing things frequently, 
and getting that feedback, releasing in small increments. And thirdly, the third principle, team collaboration. A successful, you can't really have a successful product without having team collaboration. So it's the key to making your project work, if you are running projects, and also it's the key to building a better product. So it's about not relying on documentation to define requirements and share knowledge. It's also, it's really about face-to-face -face communication, whether that's through video conferencing or, you know, you're actually in person. It's really about sort of getting your whole team and everyone involved in sharing decisions and making decisions together, rather than, again, defining things up front in isolation. And remember, your clients or stakeholders, they're part of the team too. Don't sort of isolate them. You need them working with you to build a successful product. So back to Agile now. Um, this is the Agile Manifesto site. I think it was built in 2001 and probably hasn't been changed since because it's just this terrible image sort of repeated down the page. But the four kind of core values behind Agile, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan, they all tie into these three core principles. So customer first, frequent delivery, and team collaboration. And what about Lean? So Lean is like kind of a cousin to Agile. Agile was born out of software delivery, lean out of product manufacturing. But again, the lean principles, focus on customers, optimize the whole, eliminate waste, learn first, deliver fast, keep getting better, and energize workers. Again, they all relate to these three principles. So customer first, frequent delivery, team collaboration. So the case study that I'm talking about today, Specsavers. Um, they are in opticians. They sell glasses um, and contact lenses online and in high street stores. They are based in the UK, but they are also international. They have stores in Australia, Spain, the Nordic countries, Netherlands. So last year, and sort of for about a year and a half, I was working with a creative and design agency. So we were responsible for all the creative design strategy and research for Specsavers. And Specsavers were split into these four product streams. So book an appointment, so booking your eye check online. Contact lens e-commerce, so selling contacts online. Virtual technology, which was kind of when you can try on glasses, um, you know, through your webcam and things like that. And then also glasses e-commerce, so selling glasses on, online. And we were working in Scrum. So how it was set up, um, the client, they had a product owner, and they had a product owner and a scrum team for each product stream, so four of them. We worked with a third-party development agency who ran the development and QA, and we did the overall strategy, research, and then we had a UX um, and design pairing who sat in each product stream, so these four scrum teams. So there were lots of problems which I'll talk about in a minute, but we had to go through kind of this problem-solving um, process with this process that we were um, following with Scrum. So we had to understand the problem. We had to devise a plan. We had to carry out the plan, and we had to look back, so inspect and adapt. So this is the kind of structure I'll go through today and talk through what we did with Specsavers. So firstly, we had to understand the problem. And you might think from the title of my talk, I will talk about the problems with Scrum, but it's not about that. Basically, it's not about blaming a particular framework, a particular methodology. It, like, it's not about the process that's at fault. It's how your, your process that you're applying um, affects your clients, your organization, your products, your team. It's looking at the particular case. It's not the framework's fault if, if it isn't working. So back to spec savers. So what do we know? This is pretty much everyone. So the client our team, the development agency, everyone was frustrated, everyone was angry, everyone was annoyed, the product wasn't getting built successfully, designs weren't getting through to build, everyone was just annoyed. So what did we do first? We understood there were some problems in the process, but we didn't know exactly what they were. So we held a retrospective. So we, looked, we took the team together, um, and that included the client and development agency. And we ran it in the kind of stop, start, continue format. So what do you want to stop? What would you like to start? 
and what do you want to continue? And there weren't that many continues, but <laughs> that was the whole point of doing this. And we found that a lot of them fit into these three core principles, these three sort of underpinning themes. So we had requirements were being defined by the product owner, which might sound all very well, but actually it wasn't the customer defining the requirements for the product. The PO was just saying, yep, let's put this in the backlog. It was also being defined by the technology. So the development agency were building on top of quite a legacy code base. There were a lot of issues with it. Um, we had to build, we were basically designing based on the technical limitations of the code base. It was also a bit of a feature factory. I don't know if you've heard that term before. But we were just looking at features and deliverables and trying to get them out as fast as possible. And also, importantly, there was no customer testing uh, prior to release. So we design, build, release, and then we test sort of post-launch. Sprint releases weren't happening. So we were basically trying to fit way too many stories into each sprint. They weren't getting done. We didn't release. We were moving things to the next sprint. The work that we were doing as a creative and design agency wasn't getting built, so where we were looking at bigger things and not just the small fixes, um, it just wasn't getting through. We weren't working as a team, and that wasn't just our team, which was split into these four kind of UX and design pairings. It was the team that involved the development agency and the client. We weren't working as a team. We had these siloed product scrum teams, so we weren't looking at it as a holistic product. We were looking at it in four separate split sort of streams. Not everyone was involved in decisions. There were a lot of ma um, decisions made in isolation. And we were also, as the design agency, getting told what to design. We got some very prescriptive stories in where uh, the PA would be very sort of definitive about what they wanted, design this. So what did that lead us to? It led us to sort of understand that we needed to focus on the core principles. We needed to look a more customer-first approach. And we needed to work towards building a better product for customers. It was really about a better product, and it was about the customers. So we needed to devise a plan. So we basically decided to implement product discovery and dual track agile. So product discovery first. Product discovery is about discovering and testing that what you are building is what your customer needs. Not what your product owner wants, not what the tech limitations are deciding, but it's what your customer needs. And there's quite an important distinction here. It's about delivering what your customer needs rather than what you, um, so you and your team, or even the customers think that they want. Even if your customer thinks that this feature will actually um, solve their problem, it might not. It might not be actually what they need to solve their problem. So I've got a good example of this. I don't know if you know Lord of the Rings, quite a popular film. Um, all these guys think that they want something. They really, really want something. But actually, it isn't what they need. The ring doesn't solve them any problems. It actually causes death, destruction, wars. It's really not what they want. So how do we map this process out, the product discovery process? We looked at existing data research um, and basically looked at it getting insights. So there were a few sort of core things we looked at with this. And firstly, we had the luxury of having an existing sort of products. We had websites um, and apps to look at. And we basically could get all the data, look at where customers, what pain points were, what they were doing on the sites, where they were exiting, you know, what they were spending time on. So we could look at that and gain insights from that. Competitor research, it's really a good one to look at. Even if your competitors aren't doing it right, it's really good to understand the landscape there. And also existing research. Um, if you're looking at things like, I mean, one of the things we were looking at was the checkout process. It's quite a sort of common thing in e-commerce. So actually, there's a lot of existing research there, out there already that you can get hold of and save yourself a lot of time and money. So we, I think, bought a case study on the checkout for $100 or something. Um, but it had loads and loads of valuable research of just about ideal states of checkout, which had gone through loads of rigorous customer testing. And we also um, ran some focus groups. So customers who wear contact lenses, wear glasses, um, got them in a room, started asking them questions, trying to um, delve into more behavioral insights. So we gathered all these kind of insights to look into the pain points. What, what, what are the customer pain points? 
So then we looked at the problem statement. So the problem statement is about focusing on the problem that you're trying to solve and defining a measurable outcome so you're not just jumping straight to the solution. And this is really important. This was a big reframing for our entire process. We weren't just immediately going into defining features and deliverables. We were actually looking at what problem are we trying to solve with what we do and what's the outcome of this. So problem statements value outcomes over outputs. It's about an outcome, what sort of change you want to see in the world. It's not about what feature you want to see out there. So Albert Einstein said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. And actually, myself included, I think a lot of our companies, organizations tend to spend 55 minutes thinking about the solution and only five minutes thinking about the problem. We're very solution focused. So a problem statement can be phrased as a question, and it kind of boils down to this. You can see, um, if you Google it, there's lots of sort of frameworks you can use out there for problem statements, but this is quite a kind of simple one, which is how might we do this action so that we get this benefit? So on Specsavers, um, we looked specifically at the contact lens e-commerce journey as our first kind of product discovery um, task. So on the contact lens journey, you go to the contact lens um, package page, you click on your buy button, and you get this lovely pop-up, um, which actually includes so much information. So you get where you have to put in your prescription, for your right eye, for your left eye, and prescriptions can be a quite a confusing thing. So there's a couple of options there for sphere, there's sort of adding type, because these are multifocal, then you've got quantity for each eye, but not only does it do that, every time you change your prescription, it has a look up to see if they've got the product in stock, which then sort of has a little spinning sort of wheel and then comes back with the information and then you get your total price. Not only do you get your total price, you get your um, delivery time and your delivery cost as well. So think about how much information is just in this one pop-up. And what did uh, Specsavers find? Basically, there's a 55% drop-off at this point in the journey, which is quite understandable when you look at how much information is being surfaced in one space, one place here, one pop-up as well. So then once you add it to the basket, um, the next sort of step is checkout. And there was a 23-step checkout process. 23 steps. Can you imagine, like, clicking through, filling in fields 23 times to get to your end purchase? after having to do that awful pop-up. So it was a terrible journey. So our problem statement was how might we make prescription entry more simple so that customers can complete contact lenses purchases more easily? So quite a simple framing of a problem. But actually, what we could do with a problem statement is actually refer back to that. When we start looking at features, when we start looking at sort of design and build, we can actually say, are we trying to actually solve this problem? Next, we need to develop some assumptions. So an assumption is a declaration that is assumed to be true. So now we've got a problem, let's make some assumptions. Let's start making these guesses about the user, about the customer, who they are, what they're doing. Let's um, look at things like features now. Let's suggest features. Let's see how we can think about how to solve these problems. So some questions that you can ask when you're making assumptions. Look at our customers have a need to. These needs can be solved with. What problems does our product solve? When and how is our product used? What features are important? So now you can start sort of making assumptions about features. How should our product look and behave? And we will solve this through doing X. So these are just some of these kind of assumption questions you can use. So we made a couple of assumptions around this um, contact lens journey. So we need to separate out the prescription and the delivery in the journey to cause less confusion and ease this one pain point. So that's quite a simple one. We remove the kind of one pop-up which contains all this information and then separate it out. But it's an assumption. We don't know if it's going to work. Another feature we came up with, we should provide customers with the ability to express reorder based on their last purchase to save them refilling in their prescription. Again, seems like quite an obvious one, but the site wasn't doing this at the moment. It didn't store your prescription. 
So next, we've got the problem, we've got assumptions that we've made around it. So now we want to look at how we test these assumptions. So this is the big thing about the product discovery process. It's testing and learning. So we want to look at some hypotheses. So this is a hypotheses framework. It's quite standard, but it's we believe that doing, building, or creating this for this user or persona will achieve this outcome. And we'll know we're right when we see this seg signal or metric. So you're basically making your assumption, but you're looking at the outcome and also some measurement around it, which is really important. So our hypothesis um, was we believe that separating the prescription and delivery for contact lens purchases will achieve a decrease in drop-off at this point in the journey. And we'll know we're right when we see more customers completing this prescription step. So you can put some like proper measurements against that last one. You can try and sort of get percentages out of it if you want to look at percentage drop off, but we kind of kept it quite broad. Just more customers completing the prescription step. So now we go into the UX sort of design process. And just to say that those last few steps, so problem statement, assumptions, hypotheses, it doesn't need to take long. It might sound like a lengthy process, me sort of talking it through. But we did things like this in a half-day workshop where we got the client and the development team in too, and we just ran through kind of what problems we had. Everyone started making assumptions, and then we sort of defined some hypotheses to test. So it can be a really quick process. It doesn't need to take a lot of time. So again, so there was some quick UX and design against this. Again, not spending weeks like pixel perfect designs. It isn't needed. Because then we move on to a prototype, and this is what's really core to being able to test with your customers. And we looked at three types of prototyping. So first was low fidelity. So these um, are more static prototypes. So they're to gauge reactions to concepts and propositions. And it's about testing short journeys and simple goals. And we use just clickable designs so in Envision. So it'll be very kind of quick, upload your design, get them click through, and then you can put this in front of a customer and get some feedback. It didn't take too long. We've then got medium fidelity designs, and these are, uh, sorry, prototypes. And these are more interactive, so it's about getting input on an experience or getting input on mechanics of a journey. So you can test new products and features, look and feel, and motion principles, so something like this carousel you can see here. And we use principle for this, for the animation. And then we've got high fidelity, so that's a live prototype. So this is to gauge reactions to true functionality of full scenarios. So it's testing look and feel, but also complex interactions. And you can see here, this is where we started testing the prescription fill-in, with the drop-downs, having to select your prescription for each eye. And we did this in an HTML prototype. So again, that can sound a bit like a lot of effort. The clients or stakeholders aren't going to pay for this. We had a hybrid designer and developer who actually built this in a two to three days, and it was the full um, contact lens journey he built as a prototype. So then it's about testing, real sort of crux of it. So it's about talking to customers. So we did this in a variety of ways depending on what we wanted to test. Firstly, face-to-face um, -face interviews. So this is really good for the kind of high fidelity prototypes. So we use a recruitment agency to get sort of some um, participants in. And we had our UX designers sitting down with the customers and actually kind of going through our prototype with them, which um, provides really valuable, really valuable feedback. There's also online testing. So there's sites like validately.com, usertesting.com, where you can upload designs to um, with questions and then You'll get customers um, or users participating in it and filling out questionnaires, but also talking through their journey and talking through their thoughts as they go through the journey. And there's guerrilla testing, which actually is one of my favorites because it's really cheap and quick. So we had our um, UX designer go out onto the streets and go to a coffee shop. And basically, he'd just grab random people and say, I'll buy you a coffee if you look at this design and tell me, you know, answer a few questions on it which obviously cost a few pounds <laughs> in England, but it's very quick, it's very cheap. And we got immediate feedback. So that's more probably for the low fidelity prototypes. So when you've got some clickable designs, you can just show them. And then also surveys. If you wanted to look at more quantitative data, you could send out a survey to existing customers 
um, and ask them to mark things on a scale of 0 to 10. It will give you some sort of quantitative data there. So there's a few of the things we used. So you've got your insights. Now it's time to iterate. So it's about testing and iterating. If you have got a hypothesis that you test and it doesn't work, you can bin it. You don't have to keep it. You don't have to go ahead and build it. You can just put it back aside and focus on something else. That's the really important part of this process, I think. But if you do find something that needs tweaking, you can put it back into the process and iterate on it. So what's good about this product discovery process? It's all about validated learning. So you're actually validating what you're designing, what you're suggesting. You're validating your assumptions and feeding that into the development. You're building things that customers actually need. So you're defining and sort of testing that the customer is actually going to use this. They're actually going to appreciate the value of this. It also creates business value, and this is really important. So the business will get value out of something if the customers are going to use it. If you build something, launch it, and customers don't use it, you've, you've got waste. And also it creates a better backlog. So in your delivery and development backlog, you're actually feeding smart things into it. So back to Agile. Agile doesn't have a brain. So you need to sp feed smart things into your backlog. It's not going to do the work for you and decide what's useful. You need to actually refine that and decide sort of useful things to go into the development backlog, else you do get waste. So how does that fit with a development team working in Scrum? Big question. So we looked at dual track agile. So this is a kind of rough diagram of how that runs. Um, it's not quite right in terms of the loops, but it kind of works. But there's a delivery track and a discovery track. So, and they run in parallel. And basically, what it's not about, which people do kind of tend to think with dual track, it's not about having one team and separating it off and having them working separately from each other. It's about merging the team. So you've got your product owner sitting across the discovery and the delivery track. Then you've got your designers, um, design team in discovery, but also working into the delivery team. You need the designers as part of the development process too. You also need development as part of discovery. It's really important to get your developers and your technical teams involved in these conversations about what you're building. When, if, you're, if you're having those conversations up front, that's so important. And also what they're testing. I mean, it's great to actually involve your development team in talking to customers. They don't tend to get the chance to do that as much as the sort of UX and designers, but it's really important to understand the customer at the end of this product. And then QA kind of works more in delivery. So this is how we kind of ran the process. So we had two backlogs, a discovery backlog and a delivery backlog. So in our discovery backlog, we came up with epics and stories. We worked them through in a Kanban-style process. So instead of having our pair of UX and designer in each different Scrum team, we actually took them out of the Scrum teams and pulled them into one team working on one product. And we still involved them in certain, or involved when needed, in certain of the um, ceremonies of Scrum that the development team was still running, but we didn't necessarily involve them in everything that was going on. There was a lot of waste there. So we worked them more in kind of Kanban style. We got validated ideas, and we took them into the delivery backlog. And then the development team were running in the sprint cycles of Scrum. So what I think is really nice about this, and what I think is really important, is that there's a mixture of frameworks and methodologies and processes involved in all of this. Again, it's not about having one strict framework. There's a lot of snobbery out there about having to run to just Scrum, and that's it, and you have to follow it doggedly. But something like this, I think, where you can blend frameworks is really useful because you can kind of inspect and adapt and work out what's working and change it. So we used aspects of design thinking, Kanban, Lean UX, and also Scrum. So we kind of blended these processes together a bit. So how do we carry out the plan? Now, I'd like to think that everything went really perfectly. This was me just enjoying the, the brilliant <laughs> plan that we devised. But actually, oh, skipped. Actually, this was more like the reality, and especially me at times. There we go, <laughs> crying. So there were some core problems that we had. So one of the first things was, and this is quite a big one, is changing mindset. So 
we were shifting to problems and not solutions and outcomes, not outputs. It's really hard to get a lot of stakeholders on board with this, especially more senior stakeholders who are used to seeing a list of features, a list of deliverables, especially when you're working with clients and you've got a contract with them. And what's in place is like you will build these features as part of this contract. So trying to shift mindsets. We had to really take the client, the development team as well, on this journey. So we'd help run a lot of sessions with them when we wanted to implement this process to really get their buy-in on why we were doing this, why it was important to focus on the customer. It was also about working collaboratively, so there's team collaboration, obviously. So I think that's one big criticism or one big sort of worry around the dual track process is that it's not waterfall. You're not doing your big design up front and then feeding that off into the development team and you're working in isolation. It is about running this as two tracks together. So you have to work collaboratively. Despite the fact we took our UX and designers sort of out of all the, some of the, at least some of the scrum ceremonies, we didn't want to remove them completely and just work in isolation from the development team. And also, despite different processes, it's ensuring that the ways of working are clear to all. So we had a mix of different methodologies and frameworks and processes. So you've got to make it clear to whatever people are working with how they're sort of meant to work and discuss that with them and make sure it's understood. We implemented Kanban with our team. They were used to working in sprint cycles, so it was quite a big learning curve. Um, we set up a Kanban board, and the team didn't really respond to it at first, so we had to adapt it continuously for quite a, probably a few months at least to try and get it to suit our kind of work and flow progress. And then what's a really, really important thing, and the diagram I showed you before doesn't actually properly clearly show, is that... You've got your discovery backlog and you're feeding into your delivery backlog, but actually it's a cycle, it's a loop back. So once you've launched things, you're testing um, on the live product, you're getting customer feedback on that, you've got to feed, uh, feedback again, feedback these ideas into the discovery backlog. So your backlogs are continuously being updated in this kind of cycle. So something that I've used before and on this, um, which is quite useful, I don't know if you've seen one before, is an outcomes roadmap. Um, but we split it down into three core areas. So when you're doing process changes, it can be really helpful to look at um, these three areas, which are people, process, and product. And this is a sun diagram. So basically, instead of setting firm timelines for something, we're just looking at the nearest, like the smaller circle is kind of the near future, the um, bigger one is you're going a bit further out and then further out again. So it's kind of now, next, later, almost. And then we mapped outcomes that we wanted against this roadmap. So some of those kind of ones that we wanted to put in place very quickly were the team being able to feel more autonomous in their decisions, not just being told what to do by the PO, so the PO not defining requirements. We wanted to implement testing with customers quite quickly. And we wanted to start working with problems and outcomes rather than solutions and outputs. Then further down the line, we wanted less team churn. We had a lot of team members leave when we were working the old ways because they just hated being in these little um, silos of the product. We also wanted to use a mixture of prototyping. We wanted customer feedback going into the backlog. And then further down the line, we really wanted to affect and improve the key metrics and get the development agency more engaged with the customers and not so sort of working in isolation on the tech. So these were just some of the outcomes we looked at mapping. So tips for implementing process changes. Five core bits of advice. First one is to engage your team. So it's so important to work with your team in any changes to process. If you've got a great idea, it's brilliant, but take it to your team, talk about it with them, and ask them what they think. Ask them if they've got a better idea than what you've got as well. That's always a good way to sort of expose if there is any kind of contention in the room. But engage everyone in your team. Make it a safe environment for failure. Basically, process changes will fail. You will put in place certain things that don't go right. You have to scrap them. You have to adapt and do something else. But make it safe for people to do that. Otherwise, you just won't try anything. You won't sort of go out there and implement a new process change. Inspecting and adapting, obviously a massively important part of Agile, but also when you're putting in place process changes, it's so important to do retrospectives, look back, inspect, adapt continuously. And understanding and selling the value. I talked about um, business value before, but it's really important to understand what is the impact behind 
any process change. Because if, if you understand the impact, then you're actually going to be able to sell it into the wider stakeholders who you might need to sort of convince that this is the right way to go. So for us, it was looking at the customer first approach um, and understanding the impact that that would have and talking about it to the client in terms of the metrics they were looking to improve, like conversion, for example. So we really sold in the value that our changes should make. And it is about involving everyone. So it's not just your team. It's any third parties, clients, stakeholders, getting everyone involved. So what we did is, um, I think I mentioned it before, but we held these kind of workshops up front. We worked through our process changes with the client, with the development team, involved everyone. So looking back, inspecting. So what, went, what was still wrong with us when we had implemented this process and it had been going for a while? Specsavers still work in product silos. They still split off their product into those four streams. We couldn't affect that, unfortunately. It was too little too late for some people. We still had members of our team leave or want to leave, either the company um, or just the team and work on something different. They were just burnt out from the old process. So sometimes changes won't you know, help everyone. And there's still a lot of tech debt in the code base. So despite wanting to obviously push for a customer first approach and not focus on the tech limitations, there was still a lot of tech limitations. So we had an ideal state we wanted to build, and sometimes we could not build that straight away. So we had to start looking at other solutions to this. And that's where we started exploring different options where we could actually build a front end separately. Um, what went well, though? What was good? We had a focus on the customer, finally. There was less development waste. We weren't building things um, that just completely failed. We did achieve better key metrics, and we achieved better conversion, which translated to actually quite a lot of um, extra profit for the company, for spec savers. And we had a happier team, which was really important. Despite a few people still leaving, in general, we managed to make these changes and actually have a great sort of team atmosphere instead of these kind of individual pairs like working in silos. So by thinking about the core principles around good product delivery, you can make customers and your team happier, which basically equals this, hopefully. So thank you. We've got a few minutes left over if there are any questions. Someone at the back. And we'll come to you next. Uh, a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, one is you uh, explicitly called out how for the design process you looked at Kanban and yeah. for the actual development, Scrum. So question, uh, were there any specific reasons why Scrum or Kanban could not work for both? Yeah, so um, what the problem was with Scrum for our sort of UX and design pairings, um, especially working in the same sprint sort of cycles that the um, development team were working, is that the focus was very much on tech and what we could build, and it was a very rushed process in terms of we have to have something delivered for this sprint release. By kind of freeing us up from that and moving to the Kanban approach, we, um, we had a bit more freedom to explore things properly, to put the right amount of time and focus in the product discovery process. So it wasn't, it was more not having time boxes, really. And I think why we couldn't all work Kanban was a lot because it was a third-party development agency. They were very, very set up for Scrum. It was how their sort of operations model, it was all sort of how they focused and worked. So it was very hard. It would have been very hard to change what they were doing. So we had to kind of think about us firstly, but also the overall kind of benefit. Would Kanban actually work with this? And we felt that we can still work in the Kanban style and just be dropping things into the delivery backlog. We didn't have to do it every two weeks. We didn't have to work on a time box, sort of within a time box, basically. Sure. Um, second question was around, you said you did away with the whole concept of a specific product owner. You were working directly with the customer. So what was your experience there in nobody being there as the voice of the team as such, right? Because generally the product owner plays that dual communication channel and he makes sure that his availability ensures that team does not get stuck on certain stuff. So, were yeah. your customer available 100% of the time with the team? 
Can you share something? Yeah, so the product owner was 100% um, available. They were sort of working across both, both tracks, but they were working in these product silos still. So we'd have one product owner on contact lens e-commerce, but they weren't looking at the glasses e-commerce. So that's where I think the issues were as well. The product owner was fully available for the team. That was actually not a problem but they were fully available for a certain part of the product. So what we had to do as part of this is actually try and pull the product owners together. They barely talk to each other. and it's, That sounds really crazy on you. You were looking at one product. So we had to try and get them together and work with them in these kind of, I think we ran at first quarterly workshops because they weren't based in London. Um, but we got them together and we actually got them to start looking at um, the kind of problem statements, assumptions, hypotheses together so that they were thinking about the product as a whole rather than in, in these kind of silos. I think that was the main issue that we had with them rather than them being available. There was someone at the back there. At the back, I'll just take it. Hi, um, thanks Suzanne, that was really interesting. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is more around um, I mean, obviously, the idea for a dual track development process across UX and developers is, is fantastic. It also energizes the team. But the big challenge that I see implementing this, at least in, in my setup, and I know for a lot of people in Bangalore, is we are uh, captive product units where the, the sort of main team might be based outside India. So in that situation, do you have any sort of tips or suggestions or techniques for how we build that customer empathy? and? You know, especially from a product owner perspective, we are doubling up across both the tracks. How do we make sure that we are most making ourselves more most relevant as opposed to just outsourcing it to the UX team based in the yeah, UK? Yeah. No, um, with kind of remote teams in different time zones, it can be quite difficult to implement and that's another level onto it. I mean, we were working, so Specsavers are based, I don't know if you know this, but an island in, called Guernsey, which is near France actually, so south of England. They were on there. Um, the development team was sort of a few hours away. So we weren't in different time zones, but we were in different places. So we had to think about, firstly, that we're remote. You know, we want this whole sort of team collaboration to work, so we needed to use kind of video conferencing. We really needed face-to-face -face discussions. The client was invested in that, so they made sure that at least quarterly we were all meeting up um, as a team. I know that might not be as feasible as well, going across the country. Um, so I guess on different time zones, what we would do or could do is look at what core sort of things are needed to be done together. I don't think, we didn't involve our UX and design pairings in every single scrum ceremony with the scrum teams. That's what they were doing before and we found that actually quite wasteful. They were sitting on these long calls about bug fixing and they just didn't need to be on that. They could have been, their time could have been better spent. So we isolated and started tracking which ceremonies would be most useful for everyone to attend and who those people would be. So it didn't need to be every UX or in every designer or in every kind of sprint planning meeting, for example, but it was good to have that representation there. So I guess with kind of different time zones as well, which I think was your question, it's kind of isolating those core sort of points where you do need to get together and making sure that you arrange those times so that everyone can attend. So and there's lots of good tools um, you can use to have more kind of interactive sessions. I can't remember what it's called now, but there's like an online whiteboard tool, which we've used before to kind of be a bit more sketchy about stuff, so you're not just all like on a phone talking against each other because you don't know when there's a bit of a time delay, etc. So, I guess that would be my advice. Thank you. I guess just one last question. Um, thank you for the session. Um, and I could relate to the uh, dual track agile mode because we are following that in our uh, in our projects, wherein we have a team. Uh, which is working on uh, building and discovering the backlog for future PIs and there is a delivery team working on a particular PI. So what my understanding was that this has to be at PI boundaries, right? Where the discovery has to be one or two PIs or releases ahead of the delivery uh, cycle. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, sorry, was that your question? Sorry, no. uh, yeah, that, uh, that was there. And the other thing is we normally have a lot of metrics to track progress during a the delivery cycle, but do we have some metrics to track the discovery phase of it? Uh, we have burned down charts to track the delivery cycle, but what about metrics to track the discovery uh, phase yeah. of the Agile? Um, so I guess firstly we were, yeah, we, I guess even though it's dual track, you're not completely 
sitting like that in a sense because you are feeding stuff into a backlog so there is a bit of staggering but we were trying to not make it a waterfall approach where we'd be designing and then handing off it wasn't that sort of process what we were trying to do is still get that interaction between developers and designers throughout the discovery process and throughout the development process so it wouldn't be necessarily that a developer would sit on every single meeting or whatever but we needed their involvement in that sort of assumptions, hypotheses. You know, we're looking at features, we're looking at solutions, we're sketching things, you know, how will that work? We needed the development input. So although we're staggering off kind of putting stories into the backlog, we were still working together. So a bit more sort of, um, yeah, dual track rather than separate track. Sorry, what was your second question again? Um, the second one was about metrics. Yes. We have a lot yeah. of metrics uh, for delivery. Cool. So, I mean, we implemented Kanban, and there's definitely there were certain metrics we started looking at within that. So our work in progress flow, so how quickly things were moving through. Um, we had limits on that, so we'd look at where the bottlenecks were. So we looked at some core kind of metrics to do with that process, um, really. But I think the whole discovery process is about those customer outcomes, and that's what we always um, sorry that's what we always tracked against. So were we delivering something in the end which did improve did hit that customer outcome. And with the outcomes-based approach, you're looking at these metrics as well, these measurable outcomes, so you can actually track back and measure against it. So it's, it's about maybe conversion rate. It's maybe about easing a pain point and sort of not having as much drop-off like we had in that journey. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll let you go and enjoy your lunch now.